This is Professor Darif Seitz. This Java tutorial demonstrates a linked list data structure using the linked list class. A linked list is a chain of linked nodes. A node consists of two parts. It contains the data, whatever that format is, whatever type it is, and a next node reference pointing to the next node that's chained in the list. So a node is an item in a linked list and the nodes inherently allow a linkage. There's no requirement that the nodes of a linked list appear in the order that reflects their value ordering. However, the very fact that they're positioned in a linked list in a chained sequence is an ordering in itself. And it is possible and in many cases when you have a sorted linked list the ordering of the values will match the ordering in the chain. But there's no requirement for that. The uh, characteristics of a linked list is that it has a starting point called first, a first node, also known as the head, and it has a last node, also known as the end. To traverse a linked list means to visit the nodes one after another, starting with the first one. The operation names to use to discuss manipulation of a linked list, add, adds an item to the end of a list. Insert adds an item at a particular position within the list. Get retrieves an item at a particular position within the list without removing it. Set allows an, an item at a particular position to be changed. And remove retrieves and removes an item at a particular position. The particular position is referred to as the index just as it is in arrays. It's a zero relative position within the list and it's this indexing concept that makes the linked list more powerful than a queue or a stack. Those structures you cannot do anything or see anything within them. You can only deal with their boundaries. The front and the rear for a queue or the top for a stack. But the very nature of a linked list is to have full visibility into its interior and to be able to do these kinds of operations. Here's an example linked list here with the first item 55 and the last item the 23. We have a linked list demo class. We use a linked list class in there called list and it uses generics so we're our element type will be an integer wrapper class. Our main method instantiates our class and then we call the various test functions on it. And this is an example here of the use of composition to implement a simple linked list. We've embedded this list in our class rather than inheriting from something and we'll provide the functionality of those operations through composition. First function is add items. We annotate the output and what happens here is we're calling the list add function to add those items to the list in the order shown. Next we do an insert item. We're going to insert, we're going to add 101 before item 44. So this is an insert in a particular position within the list. To do that, we call our own insert before function and we pass it the 
integer 101 that we want to insert and the item before which we want that to take place. Let's go look at that insert before and then we'll come back to the test insert. Insert before is right here. It's a private um, function in our class. It returns an integer. The return value will be the index of the inserted item if we found the before item. Otherwise it will be negative 1. The two parameters are the new item to insert and the before item before which we want to make the insertion. We annotate in our output saying that we're inserting before this item and we call the list, our embedded list, its index of on before item to get the index of the before item. If that's negative 1, then we print out that we couldn't find the before item and we return negative 1 and we're done. Otherwise, we call the list add at the particular index point here and the new item to be added. And then we annotate our output and return the index. Returning the index here, <coughs> when we add an item before another item, then that other item moves in the list one position away from the, from the first item in the list, so its index changes because the indexes are always relative to the first item in the list. That's how our item took on the index of the before item because it took the slot and the before item moved down one to make room for it, so to speak. So that was the insert before. If we go back to the test insert where we were. <coughs> Next we have a test set item. Here we want to change item 5 in the list to be 500 instead. We call our own set item function passing in two parameters, the 5 and the 500. Looking at set item down here, it's a similar what we just looked at a moment ago. Set item takes the item that um, you want to set and then the new value, the new item, to replace it, to change it. We annotate the output. We look for the item in the list that needs to be changed with list index of. If we don't get it, we get a negative 1, then we're out with an, our own negative 1 return value. Otherwise, we call list set function for at that index with the new item and return the index. So that was the test set item right here. Here we have a test insert item failure. which is a case of the insert where we are asking, trying to add a, a 102 before a 45. However, the 45 is not in the list. So we will not be able to do that. It'll be a failure. It's, it's again the insert before and the problem here is with the 45 not being in the list. If we look down at the insert before again, we can see that when it tries to find the index of the before item, that's where it won't find it and it will return a negative 1 and not insert it. So that was the insert item failure test 
and um, I paused briefly and moved the test set item down because I wanted to have the two inserts right next to each other. It's a good practice to keep things logically related in your code so you can find things quickly. Moving down next we have a test remove item. Again we're talking about a specific item within the list not at a boundary point. We want to remove 100 from the list so we have a remove item function call. Remove item is a similar pattern what we've seen before. It's going to first look for the item to be removed and with a list index of if it's not found then we return negative one and get out otherwise call the list remove with that index and return the index. A remove item failure is where we try to remove an item that's not in the list. And we saw just a moment, seconds ago, the code for that, returning the negative one, and it will not remove it. There's two remove alls from the list. One iterates, well, doesn't iterate, it uses a while loop. It tests the list is empty, and as long as it's not empty, it's going to keep removing the current item uh, where it's at which well, actually it's the front, it's removing it from the, the first of the list. So while it's not empty, remove the first item and just keep doing that, eventually clearing out the entire list. So that's mainly demonstrating the is empty function available in the list to prevent having to deal with any kind of trying to access uh, something that's not there and getting an exception you have the alternative to use the is empty function. An alternative to removing everything we initialize our list back to how it was is to just call the clear function. That clears out the entire list very quickly, one succinctly in one line of code. There's a for each iterator test here because a linked list is iterable. We iterate through it and print out each item. And this is the worker function here that initialized the list for us. And down here are the functions we looked at are functions that use the embedded list to perform the various operations that we're interested in. Okay, now we're going to run this and look at the output. We start out adding items to our list. Here, here they are with the, the first item on the left here, the last item on the right. Then we insert 101 before 44 and there it is, right before the 44. Its index is now 4, according to this, at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what it is. Then we do a failure to insert. We try to insert 102 before 45. There is no 45. So it says before item, not found, and there's no change to the list. Here we change an item, changing item 5, that's the value, which was the third item with index 2 to be 500 and we see it becomes 500 and returning the index of it is 2. Zero relative indexes. Removing an item from the list, we want to remove 100 and it is gone. Failure to remove, we try to remove a 77 we get item not found, no change to the list two versions of removing all items to get an empty list. And finally, our iterator, the for each loop, goes through the list from the first towards the last, which was the order that we've seen the iterators work on the other data structures as well, the queue and the stack. Let's go back to the source code now. 
So we've looked at how we can use the linked list class to demonstrate a linked list data structure and the thing that's really unique about linked list is the total access you have to every part of that data structure. None of it is encapsulated away as it is in a stack or in a queue.